Good afternoon, dear friends and colleagues. I am Dr. Anjali Chhabra, a professor in the Department of Anesthesiology, Pain Medicine, and Critical Care at AIMS New Delhi. I am going to be giving a small talk on obstetric anesthesia in women with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 disease. During this talk, I am going to be touching on the extent of spread of the COVID-19 pandemic and the biology behind it. the modes of infection transmission and the implications for us as clinicians the management of a covid-19 parturient for labor analgesia for elective section as well as emergency lower segment cesarean section right at the outset i'd like to make a disclaimer hospital practices and resources may vary some of the facts that i present may be relevant to an ideal situation which we can aspire for and they might not be universally applicable for all hospitals at present Literature as regards COVID-19 is changing at a very rapid pace. What I say today may not be relevant two weeks from now. At the end of the presentation, we will have a question-answer session where I'll be joined uh, by my two colleagues, Dr. Manpreet Kaur, who is the nodal officer for infection control practices in our department as regards COVID-19, and Dr. Mrithunjay Kumar, who helped to set up the OT in the isolated standalone. covid facility that was made in the main aims hospital for uh, living patients now uh, i'd like to begin my presentation uh, it was in on march 11 uh, 2020 that uh, the covid 19 uh, disease was declared a pandemic by the who and now almost 3 months later uh, we see that almost 8 million people spread over 188 countries are infected by this disease so there's hardly a country on the globe which is been spared by this disease and the numbers are rising rapidly in our own uh, city or state delhi there are about 45000 confirmed cases with about uh, nearing 2000 deaths due to this disease Uh, the rapid progression rate uh, uh, due, uh, caused by covid-19 can be explained by this example uh, if we take a 10 day period from march 19 to 29 there were 250000 positive cases over 163 countries uh, to begin with and over a period of 10 days the number more than doubled to 700000 patients in 177 countries in contrast if we study another uh, beta corona virus that is the middle uh, east respiratory syndrome causing mers virus uh, over a period of 7 years only uh, uh, 2500 cases have been infected and that too in a single country that is mainly in a single country that is saudi arabia the causes for such rapid progression of the uh, covid-19 disease is because of the long incubation period of Uh, uh this uh, virus patients uh, may uh, be infected for as long as 2 to 14 days before they start showing symptoms but they become they start shedding the virus almost 2 days after getting infected and uh, they also can be asymptomatic carriers who are shedding the virus without others knowing that they are uh, uh, diseased or infected the uh, minimal effective dose that is required for a person to get infected is also lower with this virus a few hundred virions are enough to uh, to, uh, to cause infection to be established in a host this virus also causes an earlier and higher higher viral load in the upper respiratory tract so if an infected person uh, coughs or sneezes there's more chance that they will disseminate the virus into the atmosphere the virus has 10 to 20 times greater affinity for the ace receptors ace2 receptors than the sars cov1 virus which is again another uh, uh, beta corona virus that caused an epidemic in 2003 so this virus is more virulent than the other beta corona viruses that is the mers and the sars fortunately it has a lower fatality rate of only 2.3 unlike these viruses which had a higher fatality rate now the modes of transmission are mainly by droplet and contact droplet is uh, particles which are generally more than 5 to 10 microns in diameter and they are generated when an infected person coughs or sneezes and the droplets fall on the oral or nasal mucosa of an adjoining person or even on their conjunctiva and these droplets are slightly heavy so they disperse to a maximum radius of 2 meters 
uh, uh, transmission of the disease can also occur by indirect contact. If these droplets uh, land on certain fomites or inanimate surfaces and a person touches these inanimate surfaces with their hands and then touches their own face, then one transmits the infection from these surfaces to one's upper respiratory tract. There is also evidence of airborne infection, though it is uh, more so in uh, laboratory settings. Uh, uh, people have used uh, a three injector uh, nebulizer, um, collison uh, nebulizer, and they have generated droplet nuclei, which are less than five microns in diameter. And they found that these, my, these small aerosol or microns, uh, small droplet nuclei, remain suspended in air as a mist, and they remain. Uh, for as long as uh, they can remain viable for as long as three hours in the lab setting. This has not been replicated in the clinical setting. And because they are such tiny particles, they can travel longer distances. And what we should remember as clinicians is that in the hospital settings with everyday practices, we can generate these aerosols. So in addition to the standard practices for preventing transmission, we should be aware of the aerosol generating practices. There is uh, evidence that the intestines are infected and the virus is transmitted in the feces. But as of now, there is no evidence of fecal oral transmission of this disease. So to protect against uh, uh, disease transmission, we should uh, keep in mind uh, the following features. Number one, physical distancing for a meter or more, which can decrease the risk of transmission uh, by about threefold or fourfold. Then the use of face masks and which can prevent uh, disease transmission again by fourfold and use of eye protection. All this prevents that droplet as well as direct contamin contamination and this when combined with hand hygiene that is frequent hand washing for 20 seconds or de decontamination with alcohol rubs can go a long way in preventing uh, the disease transmission. However, as uh, healthcare professionals, we have to be aware of the aerosol generating pro procedures that I spoke to you about. These include endotracheal intubation, extubation, bronchoscopy, open suctioning, nebulization, bag mask ventilation, even disconnecting a patient from a ventilator can cause the pressurized gases to be released in the atmosphere and together with them they can be released of the aerosols into the atmosphere which can infect the people who are standing around. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation can also cause dissemination of aerosols and infected particles because the system uses high flows and positive pressure which on uh, leaks or the disconnections can disseminate into the atmosphere. Procedures such as tracheostomy and cardiopulmonary resuscitation can also cause uh, aerosol generation and release into the atmosphere. So as clinicians, we have to take precautions and prevent, protect ourselves from these aerosol generating procedures in addition to the standard uh, practices for preventing transmission of infection. Now coming to a pregnant patient with COVID-19 disease, we all know that the uh, uh, COVID-19 disease causes an heterogeneous presentation and the symptoms that a patient can be presenting with can be very very mild, fever, cough or general flu-like symptoms. Sometimes uh, pregnant patients can also present with gastrointestinal symptoms such as diarrhea, vomiting and abdominal pain even in the absence of respiratory symptoms. Many of these symptoms that I have spoken to you about which are features of a mild COVID-19 disease are non-specific symptoms that can be attributed to pregnancy or labor and therefore a high index of suspicion must always be there to diagnose this disease. Early data mostly coming from China suggests that pro pregnant patients with COVID-19 disease are more likely to have a mild disease unlike uh, what was seen with the SARS and the MERS epidemics where the pregnant patients had more morbidity and the neonatal outcomes were worse in pregnant patients who were infected with these um, uh, diseases. Uh, but we also must remember that uh, most of these patients that whom we have data about were primarily infected with the virus in the third, in the third trimester of pregnancy. And we will have data coming in from the Western world 
where the pregnant uh, part, uh, patients are more likely to have more comorbidities and to be of a slightly elderly age group. We, uh, if we compare the uh, data in pregnant patients from China, um, it was found that only 8% of uh, the patients had severe disease where they had respiratory rate of more than 30 per minute or a saturation of less than 93% on room air or a PO2 FiO2 ratio of less than 300. These are the patients who might require advanced oxygen supplementation. Only 1% of patients had critical illness which required mechanical ventilation and stay in the ICU. On comparison with the general population of the, from the same place, 14% uh, had a severe disease and 6% had critical illness requiring ICU stay and mechanical ventilation. So right now the data suggests that COVID-19 is more, mostly a mild disease in pregnant patients. However, a patient presenting to the hospital, especially an obstetric patient in labor, has to be screened and stratis stratified. They might come uh, in, uh, either with mild symptoms or they might be having obvious respiratory distress. Uh, the patients who are COVID negative, who, uh, they can be screened and stratified by taking a detailed history. And this should be done at the, uh, at the entrance of the maternity facility so that they don't intermingle with the other normal patients. So if the patient is uh, gives no history and does not come from a containment area and has no relatives who are infected, they can be managed in the usual labor wards and rooms and they have to be taken care of by the obstetric unit, staff and facility uh, which is usually done. In addition, we might have patients who are asymptomatic carriers or uh, these asymptomatic carriers are very difficult to detect. We can get history of uh, their near relatives being infected in the past or they can be coming from uh, containment areas but uh, you know, um, from containment areas but at times they might not manifest the disease or they might be mildly symptomatic. There might be patients who have uh, symptoms suggestive of uh, COVID disease but we cannot wait for uh, the investigations to come. Uh, RT-PCR takes about 8 to 10 hours to give a report and uh, we can't wait, wait for a laboring patient to manage a uh, patient. So such a patient should be considered to be a suspect under investigation and it should be treated in the same way that a confirmed COVID positive patient is treated. And for these patients, what is recommended is that a well-fitting N95 mask should be put at the entrance for this uh, for such a patient, and they should be transferred to a COVID facility or an area which is earmarked for COVID patients, or they should be kept in a isolation room where there are where there is negative pressures maintained and six to twelve. Uh, air exchanges per hour take place so that the virus does not accumulate in the room and uh, the viral load in the room is low. A number of societies have recommended uh, that instead of putting a well-fitting N95 mask for the patient, a normal surgical mask should be put for the patient. But a N95 mask prevents 70% virus transmission even when put on an infected uh, person as compared to 40 to 50 percent virus transmission uh, prevention which is done by a surgical mask and so um, I think an N95 is safer when we know that the patient is infected. Of course if we don't have N95 masks enough to put for patients then we can use a surgical mask ideally a fluid resistant three ply mask. In addition an N95 mask by, uh, by uh, ensuring a good fit prevents any lateral uh, spread of uh, um, um, air from the sides of the mask and that also prevents droplet dissemination. Now once the patient has been kept in an isolated room, the further treatment can be decided by a multidisciplinary team consisting of obstetricians, neonatologists and anesthesiologists and the plan should be made based on the maternal and fetal condition. If the patient is in early labor, labor analgesia can be done or depending on the indications and elective or an emergency cesarean section can be done to deliver the baby. Epidural analgesia or labor analgesia early in labor is encouraged. It has two fold advantage. Number one, 
aerosol generation is decreased because if the patient cries out in pain, she is more likely to generate aerosols. And secondly, the need for general anesthesia is minimized if uh, the patient has to be converted for a cesarean section. The same epidural catheter that has been used for labor analgesia can be used, can uh, drug can be administered and converted for uh, an providing anesthesia. And the conversion rate, failure rate is less than 5%. And time needed for conversion is uh, 3 to 5 minutes if we use 10 to 15 ml of 2% lignocaine uh, to convert it from analgesia to anesthesia. So if the obstetric uh, colleagues tell us well in advance, by the time the patient is shifted into the OT for the cesarean section, the uh, uh, epidural anesthesia can be activated without the need for giving general anesthesia. Unmedicated natural labor in, is to be avoided at all costs because like I said, it, is, it can cause aerosol generation during forceful uh, exhalation and pain. Uh, by a number of societies, uh, epidural labor analgesia, performing uh, a, a epidural for labor analgesia is considered to be a non-aerosol generating procedure. But it varies from patient to patient. Some patients might shriek out in pain. So it is uh, better that it is performed in an isolated room, preferably in a negative pressure room. And uh, it is, uh, I'll be talking about the personal protective equipment that the uh, uh, anesthetist should be wearing and the other team member should be wearing. And it is advisable that a baseline platelet count is done before doing a neuroaxial blocks because there are reports of thrombocytopenia with the COVID-19 disease. Uh, vertical transmission, there is very little evidence there is minimal to non-existent uh, evidence of vertical transmission so a vaginal delivery uh, can be done normally now uh, coming to the personal protective uh, equipment uh, like i said earlier neuroaxial neuro anesthesia is considered to be a non-aerosol generating procedure but uh, we would still recommend that if this person wears a, a well fitted n95 mask in case they are not available then fluid resistant surgical mask can be used. In addition, a surgical cap or hat that we usually wear in the OT can pr uh, protect the hair. Goggles and eye shield should be worn like I had shown you in the infographic earlier. And this should be accompanied by a fluid resistant gown or a coverall uh, together with shoe cover and at least two pair of gloves. The outer glove should be sterile. Uh, so, these are the uh, recommendations, but a recent paper uh, which was published in the British Journal of Anesthesia found that 1 out of 37 or 2.7% anesthetists with level 3 PPE develop PCR confirmed COVID-19 disease versus 57% of anesthetists who had level 1 PPE. Level 1 PPE is the PPE that we usually wear or the uh, mask, gown or gloves that we usually wear in our OTs. Uh, and this was uh, done when patients were being given spinal and patients had mild COVID-19 disease. So the use of level 3 PPE, that is the hood, helmet and the water resistant coverall does prevent uh, uh, tra transmission of infection and there is a relative risk reduction of 95% with the use of level 3 PPE even when uh, spinal anesthesia is performed. Now, uh, uh, labor analgesia uh, should be uh, uh, done um, by uh, anesthetists who are very experienced in the procedure and one should limit the number of in-person encounters in the pre-procedure time. If possible, a video PAC can be done or the antenatal chart can be uh, scrutinized or one can do a pre-anesthetic checkup at the time that one meets the patient. Uh, when one is donned and gone in to do the procedure. Donning should be done outside in a very systematic manner. Uh, the number of personnel that enter the suite or the area where the labor analgesia is to be performed should be limited as should be the equipment. Uh, it is recommended that even the drugs can be prepared outside together with the needles and they can be carried in a sterile uh, packet inside uh, into the area where the labor uh, epidural is to be performed. We would require all standard monitoring, a heart rate, ECG, SPO2 monitoring and non-invasive blood pressure. 
In addition, the Royal College of Anesthetists also recommends that continuous electronic fetal monitoring that is cardiotopography should be done because there are reports of at least eight cases of fetal compromise amongst a series of 18 patients who re received labor analgesia. So that device would also have to be kept in the suite where the patient is being kept. Uh, it is recommended that the epidural dosing can be increased slightly instead of using 0.06 to 5% bupivacaine, which is a lower concentration, we can use 0.1% bupivacaine and that would ensure better analgesia and less breakthrough pain. Adjuvants such as fentanyl should be used again to decrease breakthrough pain. If we are using program pumps, we can increase the bolus volume from 5 to 8 to 10 ml and we can also decrease the bolus interval. Again, these are methods to prevent a breakthrough pain and avoid need for uh, frequent visits to the COVID-19 patients. And after we have ensured that the patient is well settled and hemodynamically stable, pain relief is adequate, then one should drop carefully under supervision in a designated area. More uh, infection transmission is caused by incorrect doffing than by uh, wearing, uh, um, than by failure to wear PPE. And uh, it is recommended that doffing should always be done uh, with the buddy system with someone supervising you and telling you what to do next so that you don't infect your own self. Uh, instead of visiting the patient frequently, we can uh, um, view the patient or check on the patient by a video call. But uh, always we should remember that some healthcare worker should be present with the laboring patient and they cannot be left all alone with uh, a labor analgesia. Uh, as far as elective uh, lower segment cesarean section goes, the threshold for performing LSCS should be lower than usual to minimize disease uh, transmission. I have put an asterisk over there because I will be presenting some uh, literature. But as of now, uh, there is a lower threshold for performing a lower segment cesarean section. Though uh, COVID-19 itself is disease is itself not an indication for taking up patients for cesarean section. The anesthesia of choice for a cesarean section would be a neuroaxial technique, preferably a subarachnoid block or as it's popularly known, a single shot spinal. Though a combined spinal epidural can also be used depending on the condition of the mother. And the neuroaxial technique is um, indicated unless the patient has any coagulation abnormalities, infection at the site of block or there is patient refusal. There are concerns of thrombocytopenia because there have been reports of th thrombocytopenia reported with COVID-19 infection. But like I said, most pregnant patients with the COVID-19 disease had mild disease and their platelet counts were around 1 lakh per cubic millimeter. Lower counts may be seen in patients with more severe disease. So it is safe to do a platelet count on admission. We don't need to repeat the counts over and over again and uh, it is safe to perform a spinal or a subarachnoid uh, block up to platelet counts of 70,000 millimeters uh, per, per cubic millimeter or even down to 50,000 uh, uh, per cubic millimeter. An emergency uh, cesarean section, especially a category 1 LSCS requires a decision to delivery time of 30 minutes because there's imminent threat of life to the mother or the fetus. Some centers claim that they can uh, have their personnel ready uh, and ready to and the child baby can be delivered in uh, 30 minutes within decision time. This is by, with collaborative team effort. But uh, with all the level 3 PPE that has to be done for an emergency uh, a cesarean section, this may be not possible and delays may occur and this should be informed to a patient who is opting for instance for labor analgesia. Uh, some authors have also recommended a rapid sequence spinal that is a patient is brought in uh, in the lateral position with oxygen and a very experienced anesthesiologist after cleaning uh, does a single shot spinal taking less than five minutes. Again, with the uh, clumsiness that is caused by wearing the PPA, uh, the, it's doubtful whether even a very experienced person can do a spinal very quickly. 
so the anesthesia of choice for an emergency LSCS would be uh, general anesthesia. Uh, emergency LSCS may also be uh, indicated for the severely ill COVID patient where we want to relieve uh, the respiratory symptoms by delivering the baby as well as prevent hypoxia in the uh, fetus. All cesarean sections in COVID positive patients should be done in dedicated negative pressure OTs where there can be 12 to 25 air changes per hour again to prevent transmission or collection of the virus in the uh, OT and uh, one should use disposable equipment as far as possible. Level 3 PP should be worn by all team members who are present in the OT and minimum number of personnel should be present in the OT. There should be a runner available outside uh, in to call for help in case needed. Somebody can be called or any equipment is needed. Uh, we can add on team members, but there should not be a big crowd in the OT. And to prevent in any infection transmission to the anesthesia machine, uh, HME filter, which can a uh, high quality heat and moisture exchanging filter uh, should be used and it should be placed between the face mask and breathing circuit. And this filter should be able to remove at least 99.97% of more than uh, 0.3 micron particles uh, equal to a more than 0.3 micron particles. Uh, in fact, it is recommended that two filters can be uh, attached, one between the face mask and the breathing circuit and the other between the expiratory uh, uh, tubing of the machine uh, of, uh, of the patient and the, and the anesthesia machine. Now, general anesthesia is definitely an aerosol generating procedure. So, I, as I've already said, level 3 PP should be worn by the personnel. And in order to minimize uh, the generation of aerosols, if time permits, uh, we can pre-oxygenate the patient for 5 minutes using tidal volume breathing with 100% uh, uh, oxygen and we can minimize flows. Traditionally, we are taught that patient should be oxygenated for 3 minutes with tidal volume respiration with 9 liters uh, per minute flow. But the flows can be decreased to about 6 liters per minute if um, we have about 5 minutes time. And uh, the aim is to achieve an entire oxygen concentration of 90%. Uh, it is recommended that we do a rapid sequence induction for uh, uh, inducing anesthesia and uh, one should avoid bag mass ventilation as far as possible. In case uh, bag mass ventilation after administration of the, uh, of the IV induction agent and muscle relaxant is essential, then there should be gentle bag mass ventilation should be done. One should consider using a video laryngoscope if it is available that should be preferred rather than using a direct laryngoscope which involves looking or putting one's head close to the airway of the uh, patient and uh, uh, the airway should be secured using a cupped endotracheal tube and uh, the cup should be inflated and uh, as early as possible. A second generation supraglottic airway device such as a prosil element can be used in case of unanticipated difficult intubation. But care should be uh, taken to minimize the leak around the cup so that there is minimal uh, aerosol generation. Full dose of muscle relaxant should be used during the procedure to prevent patients from coughing or bucking. And precautions should be taken during extubation um, because there is more chance that a patient will cough or buck at the time of extubation than during intubation when uh, they are given adequate doses of muscle relaxants. In order to prevent uh, aerosol uh, dissemination in the atmosphere, a number of uh, anesthesiologists have uh, recommended that uh, uh, clear transparent uh, polythene sheets can be used to cover the patient. But care should be taken that these sheets, the exposed surface of these sheets is rolled carefully at the end of the procedure and they are discarded uh, in a very methodical fashion and not left lying around otherwise they will cause uh, greater uh, disease transmission. Uh, now coming to the topic whether there should be vaginal deliveries versus cesarean sections for COVID-19 uh, patients. 98% of the delivery, deliveries conducted in China were uh, by a uh, cesarean section. 
However, a recent paper which was published in JAMA on June 8, 2020, it found that there was association between the mode of delivery among pregnant women with COVID-19 disease and the maternal and neonatal outcomes in Spain. They found that most of patients who had mild symptoms and vaginal birth had excellent outcomes, whereas uh, women undergoing uh, cesarean section, 13.5% Patients developed maternal uh, adverse outcomes, uh, adverse maternal outcomes, and 21% had clinical deterioration in the postoperative uh, period as compared to only two per patients in the vaginal birth uh, uh, arm. And uh, uh, these these uh, this study included about 82 patients. Uh, so they, the, this this study does. Uh, uh, seem to suggest that cesarean section may be an independent risk factor for clinical deterioration uh, in the mother as well as uh, for NICO admission in the uh, neonate. However, uh, the study had several limitations, one of which was the wide confidence interval, which tends to indicate that the sample size is small and we uh, like to have more data from more studies before this can be uh, categorically decided that vaginal delivery is safer than cesarean sections for patients uh, uh, having uh, uh, deliveries. And the study also, the authors also claim that they had lack of information about the neonates. So uh, we have to take the information about NICU admission with a pinch of salt. So uh, to conclude, I'd like to say that COVID-19 disease has made us change our routine clinical practices and we must adapt and accept the new normal because that is going to persist for some time. Thank you very much. I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of the Department of Obstetrics and, and, uh, and Gynecology. They make a very good uh, team and we work very well with them. I'd also like to thank the SET facility for making this presentation possible. Uh, these are the references, uh, some of the references that I have referred to, though the list is unending and quite overwhelming. And thank you very much. Good afternoon, dear friends and colleagues. I'm Uh, good afternoon to all the viewers. Uh, now we, we will start taking up questions on the same topic. Uh, for this, we have an expert panel from AIMS, uh, Department of Anesthesia. We have uh, Professor uh, Anjomi Chabra. We have Dr. Manpreet Kaur, who is uh, Assistant Professor in the Department of Anesthesia. And we have Dr. Nirpin Jai with us. So the first question is for Anjomi, ma'am. Uh, what are the general precautions to be taken during general anesthesia administration in a COVID-infected patient? So, for any uh, patient who requires general anesthesia and who is diagnosed to be COVID positive, uh, number one, like I said, we should put a well-fitting mask on the patient's face to prevent transmission of infection to the surrounding people. Uh, we should transport the patient in a manner uh, through a green corridor so that there is minimum personnel and uh, patient in that corridor when this patient is brought in. And all the team members who provide anesthesia should already be donned and ready to receive the patient. Uh, they should be wearing level 3 PPE because this is an aerosol generating procedure. And the anesthesia should be done in a dedicated uh, OT which has negative pressure and frequent air changes as many as 12 to 25 per hour. Now once the patient has been uh, received, uh, what is important is patient should be reassured and told the procedure, uh, verbal consent can be taken. There's no need to carry masks and pens inside, uh, paper and pens inside. And after the procedure has been explained to the patient, an IV line will have to be secured. In order to protect uh, the um, uh, uh, personnel, minimum number of people should be inside the OT. And uh, an IV after an IV line is in, we should also have an HME filter. I've already said these uh, points in my talk. HME filter should be uh, inserted. And uh, we should take all precautions to prevent aerosols being generated. 
I missed uh, saying that uh, a closed suction should be done. Though I said that an open suction can cause aerosol generation. And any time we need to disconnect the circuit, we should clamp the tube uh, on the patient end and then disconnect the circuit. So there is minimum aerosol generation. In addition, we should uh, also take care that uh, uh, we uh, at the end of the procedure, uh, we can give drugs such as dexmedetomidine to prevent patients from coughing and coughing. And good muscle relaxation should be maintained in all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Manpreet. Uh, how do you categorize high risk and low risk contact from healthcare workers? So here in AIMS, we categorize healthcare workers as high risk and low risk contacts. So the high risk healthcare workers are categorized basically based on four uh, points. The first being any healthcare worker who is involved with aerosol generating procedure without any of the personal protective equipment which is missing, which can be N95 mask, a face shield or goggles, uh, impervious gown and gloves. A sec second point is any household contact of a patient who has come, to be, uh, personal has come positive. Third is if uh, there is a direct contact with the respiratory secretions of a positive patient, whether it be nose, mouth or eye, then that's a high risk contact. Third, if the healthcare worker is in close uh, uh, proximity of about one meter, within 48 hours of that, anyone who has come to be positive for more than 15 minutes, then it's considered to be high risk contact. The rest all are considered to be low risk contacts. So what we follow here is that any high risk contact, if is asymptomatic, then he is tested on seventh day. And then if he comes to be negative, then he can resume his duty. While in case he comes to be positive, then he has to be uh, he has to continue his quarantine for 10 more days uh, till or to see whether there is any appearance of the symptoms. Whereas in case there is a uh, low risk contact, then he can continue with his uh, duties with all the precautions like hand hygiene, maintaining distance, social distancing. That's what we call him. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Our uh, next question is for Dr. Mithun Jai. This question says, uh, is there any special precautions to be taken for management of postpartum hemorrhage in a COVID-19 infected patient? If management of the PPH uh, remains the same with one exception, like actually we, we, we can give the uh, we give oxytocin and carbitocin the recommended dose in the bolus followed by the infusion dose as, as it is recommended if uh, uh, any uh, patient who has gone for lab labor or uh, delivery. Or cesarean section and uh, with, there is one exception in that that uh, we have to be uh, uh, avoid, we have to be very careful with the car carboplast and we have to avoid uh, uh, carboplast as much as uh, possible for two uh, reasons first reason is like this patient will be will, all, will, all, will already be hypoxic and they if they uh, develop bronchospasm so that may complicate the situation. Second reason is like if, suppose they develop bronchospasm and we have to start treating the bronchospasm, uh, we, we might have to give nebulization to the patient. And that is another aerosol genetic procedure that will put other around uh, the patient to uh, to the exaggerated risk. So it's better to avoid carboplast. And second line we can use in methyl that is a, that, that can be used. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mithun Jai. Uh, next question is for Manpreet, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, uh, as many asymptomatic patients are coming uh, these days, uh, so should we advise COVID-19 testing for all patients who are needing admission? Well, actually it should be, but uh, the POXI guidelines, that's Federation of Strategic Dining Society of in India, that recommends that any asymptomatic patient, if is likely to be delivered within five days, then should undergo uh, the COVID testing. And uh, otherwise, uh, per se, for the safety purpose, well, they should undergo. Yeah. In case it's not been uh, done till then and it becomes an emergency LSCS, then it could be done in the COVID suspect area. Okay. okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, next question is for Anjali, ma'am. Uh, what are the indications of general anesthesia in an uh, in obstetrics in a COVID-19 infected patient? Thank you, Rinchin. I think I've already answered it in my talk. Uh, emergency LSCS would be required for a category 1 indication when there's imminent threat of life to the mother or the fetus. And in relation to COVID-19, we can do an emergency section. Suppose the mother is having such severe uh, disease that she's on a ventilator and it is thought that, uh, you know, delivering the baby will 
uh, in some way help with the decreasing the respiratory compromise due to a gravity illness. So that can be another indication, though that might not be a category one, but a category two or three. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Uh, next question for Dr. Mirkunjay. Uh, what are the recommendations on working in a pregnant working in a, a pregnant healthcare worker? So healthcare workers who are pregnant, uh, there's a uh, uh, SUG guideline on that. And uh, what what they have talked about is like uh, if the uh, healthcare workers uh, 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 who is pregnant is uh, in less than 28 weeks of gestation. And is uh, not having any comorbid illness like any cardiac or respiratory illness or uh, diabetes or hypertension if not from um, immunosuppression or any, any reason. She can start working with taking all the due precautions which healthcare workers has to take like uh, wearing the mask, uh, avoiding close contact, hand washing and uh, cough etiquettes and other things that has to be practiced. But if the patient uh, has got uh, is pregnant, that the healthcare worker or doctor or the nurses who are taking for more than 28 uh, weeks of gestation, the, uh, the recommendation says that uh, they should be uh, uh, avoiding going to the high risk area like ICUs and uh, involving, involving themselves in the air, airway, uh, air, uh, airborne uh, uh, procedures. So, so that the risk should be minimized and it's preferable they do start doing uh, telemedicine kind of consultation or uh, they can do uh, take part in some administrative work rather than going to the front area and uh, working with the, uh, uh, increasing the risk to her and uh, the patient. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Dr. Mantri. What is the safety of epidural anesthesia in a COVID patient? Well, as uh, Dr. Anjali also discussed, epidural is quite safe in a COVID positive patient. Though there is incidence of mild thrombocytopenia which can be associated with the COVID positive patients. But however, epidural is safe if the platelets is more than 70,000. And usually when a COVID positive patient is admitted, you do first platelet and that is fair enough and then you can go ahead with your epidural. Okay, okay thank you ma'am. Thank you. Next question for Dr. Mithunjay, how safe is Entenox as labor anesthesia in a COVID-19 infected patient and how safe is it for the surrounding patients and the healthcare workers? First of all, I would like to say that uh, Entenox is not very widely uh, practiced in India. It is for the, uh, mainly, mainly for the European countries it is not there. And uh, what we, uh, about the Entenox, there is a divided uh, opinion on that. Some say that it can be safely used because the flow is very less than um, uh, some say that it can be should not be used because it, again it is an airborne generating procedure and uh, uh, they are better uh, better to go for the other options like uh, uh, labor uh, epidural is a safer and more effective way of to giving labor analgesia than internox and uh, as far as the risk is concerned uh, in the flow is less it, it can be used but uh, of course uh, since airborne uh, generation is happening so risk to the surrounding uh, compared to the uh, infusion uh, pump that we are using or for the epidural uh, uh, analgesia or labor analgesia, obviously the risk will be higher. But uh, actual quantification has not uh, happened yet. And uh, uh, if you are using internox at all or for that matter any any inhalational agent that has been given to the patient, it's always prudent to uh, uh, sterilize, disinfect uh, circuits or uh, uh, obviously you have to use it with the HME filter and uh, the machines and all the all the contact uh, surface area which can happen surrounding the patient. So it's always better to disinfect with the 1% hypochloride or, or with the fogging that we can. Whatever is disposable can be discarded and the rest should be disinfected. Uh, it's better to use the disposable circuits and the uh, equipment also. I'd like to add a little point about epidural anesthesia. Uh, there is no chance of the virus spreading by the epidural injection mm -hmm. into the CNS. There is no evidence as of now and it is considered to be a safe. Okay. No chance of viral death. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. With this, uh, we finish with the questions. Uh, I think there are no more questions. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, you so much, Rajan. It's a pleasure.